Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank, Thank you so much for, for joining, joining us for, for uh, National, National Rural Rural Health Day. Day and our demonstration of telehealth. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Mary Wakefield, the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, for some opening remarks, and then we'll move on with the demonstration. So, Dr. Wakefield. Thanks, Tom, and hi, everyone. I'd really like to add a warm welcome to all of you to today, National Rural Health Day, and to this live demonstration of telehealth, an important tool for enhancing access to care for rural communities. As most of you know, telehealth isn't new. For more than 20 years, it's been a way to use technology to link rural communities with specialists and other health care providers, clinicians that often are not available in many small and rural communities. However, back in 1987, when the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy was created, the ability to deliver health services through telecommunications was just a concept embraced by engineers and some tech-savvy clinicians. And back then, it was expensive. Many rural areas did not even have dial-up internet. No doubt some of you are perhaps too young to even recall what that is. But technology has advanced. Broadband has been deployed. Equipment has become very affordable. And telehealth has become a significant component of our healthcare delivery system. At first, telehealth was just a small part of HHS's Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. But as the concept of electronic healthcare grew and gained acceptance with providers and patients, HRSA formed a new office for the advancement of telehealth that began to focus our work on telehealth. However, that office at HRSA is just a fraction of the work that we're doing across HHS to advance telehealth and to ensure that advances in healthcare delivery are moving from urban medical centers all across to our most rural citizens in the communities where they live. Telehealth is no longer solely a rural tool. Many urban areas are also leveraging this technology. And the Veterans Administration has become, become a notable innovator in the use of telehealth to serve America's veterans. Do you know that in 2013, for example, the Veterans Health Administration provided almost 1.8 million telehealth services. So across the board, we're seeing innovative ways to use this technology to support healthcare delivery. And I, for one, find that very exciting. There is a growing interest in telehealth among pro private and public stakeholders, including payers, providers, employers, state and federal government, and Congress. Let me share just a few examples. One, a new study that estimates that 58% of healthcare providers used in 2015 some form of telehealth. A Towers-Watson report that 22% of large employers in 2014 covered telemedicine consultations and that by 2017, over 68% planned to do so. In 2013, the market for telehealth generated an annual revenue of $9.6 billion, and that was a 60% growth from 2012. And currently, it's estimated that somewhere between 40 and 50% of all hospitals in the United States employ some form of telehealth. Across HHS, we're investing in a variety of telehealth applications. Our HHS Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT has just completed a new assessment of telehealth activity across the department. And what that assessment shows is that you can select almost any division with HHS. And more than likely, we've got an interesting telehealth effort underway. Let me give you just a few examples. At the National Institutes of Health, we fund a number of research studies now looking at how this technology can help to address chronic disease. At CMS's Innovation Center, we're supporting a range of telehealth projects that are showing great promise for reducing costs and enhancing care. The Innovation Center is also supporting a project called Scan Echo 
that helps us use this technology to support enhancing rural primary care providers' knowledge of specialty care to better serve their patients. CDC has long supported efforts to bring this technology to bear in addressing public health issues. And we're seeing real innovation at the state level, where state Medicaid programs are supporting a range of telehealth services. Likewise, over at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, they recently released a new evidence map for telehealth that analyzed what applications of this technology are showing the greatest promise. And I know that HRSA and the Indian Health Service will share more about their specific efforts later today. I really believe that we're at a critical pivot point in the broader use of this technology. As we shift our healthcare delivery system from volume to value, there will likely be greater opportunities to use telehealth to not only ensure access, but also to drive better quality, even while reducing the burden on patients. So for all of these reasons, HHS decided to add a telehealth focus to the celebration of National Rural Health Day this year. And we asked one of the telehealth network grantees of the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth to give a demonstration to show us what this technology is doing to deliver care and to save lives in rural America. And we are particularly excited by this telehealth visit with Avera Health in South Dakota a telehealth leader, and a site that I've personally had the pleasure of visiting. They are also partners for HHS because the Indian Health Service has recently selected Avera to expand our ability to provide care in the Great Plains area, which includes some of the most frontier areas of this country. So welcome again to our telehealth demonstration for National Rural Health Day. This is a great opportunity to hear how the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy and now the Indian Health Service are advancing rural health care through telehealth. Thanks for joining us. And Tom, thank you for your leadership. Thank you very much, Dr. Wayfield. I appreciate you joining us today. So before we move into the demonstration, I did want to just provide a little more context uh, on why we decided to do this. And one of the things you have to understand about rural health care delivery is that access is often a challenge, particularly for any sort of degree of specialty services. And so that's the reason telehealth was originally developed, um, and it's now expanded way beyond that um, to also be a tool for managing chronic care, for educating clinicians. Uh, but it's really an Thank essential you. part of the rural health care delivery system. And so what you're going to see today is a demonstration by one of our grantees, as Dr. Wakefield noted, in Avera Health. And I've had the opportunity to go out there and witness what they're doing. And they offer a suite of services across multiple states uh, that deliver a range of services, from e-emergency care uh, to e-consult uh, to also the distance learning component and e-emergency care as well. And so what I'd like to do now is introduce uh, Deanna Larson, who is the CEO of what Avera calls eCare. And I should say that while Avera is an innovator in this area, they're one of a number of organizations that we've worked with over the years that have really uh, pushed the edge in terms of innovation and creativity in terms of how to leverage this technology to better serve folks in rural and underserved areas. Uh, so, Deanna, we'll turn it over to you now. Thanks. Good afternoon, and we want to thank Dr. Wakefield. Thank you so much for being here with us today, and when you visited us, we enjoyed that. And Tom Morris, we certainly appreciate the opportunity to work with you. I, I want to mention that these leaders in, in have helped us to imagine and really create the networks of telehealth that we have available today. So for all of us out across the U.S. who have received the grants and funds that have made telehealth available, uh, we're greatly appreciative of all of that you've done for us and um, certainly the opportunity to demonstrate for you today what those funds have been able to provide for those living in rural geographies. So today, um, as we do this demonstration, I'd like to give you just a little bit of background and, uh, and some depth as, as to how Avera looks at telemedicine. And all telemedicine providers, as we've looked at it, we first started really thinking about it was access. It was access for those living in rural communities to really be able to have maybe a specialist, a cardiologist, or a pulmonologist see them. 
But as we looked deeper into that and as out of need we needed to create the opportunity for patients to be able to see these providers, we began to see even deeper impact that telehealth was providing. We were able to see that recruitment of physicians into rural communities, nurses and other health care workers was difficult because they're often working in isolation and don't really have the colleagues that they need. We were able to see that all too often patients were being transferred into tertiary facilities due to the fact that either the local providers were not as comfortable or confident as they wanted to be and so the opportunity to transfer seemed to be the best resource available to them. So what we've seen as we started to put telemedicine services out in these rural communities is that we were able to provide colleagues for physicians, for nurses, that at the push of a button they're no longer alone in an emergency department, that nurses can call other nurses and get some support as to how they should proceed with care. I want to be sure that those of you watching this can imagine what it's like to be alone in a rural community where during the middle of the night there really only are two nurses likely in the building. Someone arrives with a patient who really needs critical care and they need to call their physician in. This is when at the push of a button you have a board certified ED doc in the room with you really starting care and services as you are waiting for that local physician to come to that building. So what happens during that time is you think about the time to transfer. So if you arrive in one of these rural facilities and you're having a heart attack or a stroke and you need to wait for someone to come in before you even decide to transfer to a tertiary facility, minutes and time are lost. But if you have an ED physician and nurse sitting here in the E-Helm in Sioux Falls, actually maybe working with a facility in Montana, you're able to see that that facility is going to need help in transferring to the closest local tertiary facility. We can start to make those calls while those local providers in the room can start to do the IV placements or to do other hands-on care that's provided. You can also imagine that in a small rural community that the person who arrives in that ED is known probably a personal friend. And so when those life events happen and they're life-threatening, that team of nurses and physicians locally are working with someone they know. And the life-threatening issue that is in front of them becomes even more difficult to deal with. You can imagine if you virtually have a board-certified ED doc in the room with you, collegially making decisions, thinking about that next thing that has to happen for that patient. You're no longer working in isolation. You're working in a team. These are typically family practice physicians, nurse practitioners, and PAs, who when they took their training, they were trained alongside of ED physicians, cardiologists, pulmonologists. So what we're actually doing is we're equalizing the level of care. If you were to arrive in a tertiary facility today with a stroke or a heart attack, there would be numerous physicians and nurses in the room. Now when you arrive at a rural facility, there is actually that same level of care. It's that you're virtually bringing those specialists into the room, equalizing that care to that that they would have and access to providers that they would have in a tertiary facility. So the suite of services that Avera offers, there are several other providers out there that have many services. What we offer today was really largely built on what was needed in rural communities. Support during the night for emergency, support with e-pharmacy, support with ICU, and long-term care services. So I want to make sure that we give plenty of time for our demonstration today, and I want to tell you what you're going to see. In our demonstration, you're going to see Dr. Kelly Rowan and a nurse with her by the name of Becky. It's a simulated demonstration. Becky and Dr. Rowan will be called into a remote location simulated that we're going to call Montana today. And when they come into the room, they will have a bin summon that usually takes 30 to 45 seconds. The nurse in the room or the physician in the room in the remote location, Montana, hits a button. In 30 to 45 seconds, the physician and nurse are there. So when we start this demonstration, that's what you're going to see. I'd like to mention that Dr. Rowan is going to use some very, she may be doing some education during this process because she wants to make sure that all the lay people here understand what she's talking about. 
and um, understand what the process is that's going on. This typically wouldn't happen during a real course um, of an ED visit, but she wanted to make sure you understand what's happening. So, Dr. Rohn, I think we'll take it to you. Okay. Hi there, Dr. Rohn. How can we help you today? I'm here with my nurse, Mitch Becky. Hey, Dr. Rohn. I think uh, we, I've seen you on camera here before. My name is Brian, nurse practitioner. A uh, local ambulance service brought in this, uh, I'm guessing probably about a 30, 35-year-old gentleman that was found unresponsive uh, in a hallway at an apartment complex. I've done my primary assessment already. Um, and his blood sugar is good. Uh, it's actually at 110 right now. Um, I don't smell any odors of alcohol or anything like that. But he's still unresponsive, and I just I just want to bounce some things off you and kind of get some direction where to go with this. Sure, no problem. Currently, Can you um, tell me, Brian, do you, have, do you have a set of vital signs? Yeah, yeah. Currently, he is. His oxygen level is kind of low right now, seventy-five percent. His blood pressure is also low at eighty over fifty. His heart rate is, is a little bit faster. It's right about a one one ten right now. Becky, are you able to help me chart too? Yes, absolutely. I can do some timestamps. Um, what also I notice um, on your file is we have numbers to call for air transport. It sounds like this gentleman might need that as well as getting an accepting physician at your closest tertiary center. So, Yeah, go ahead okay. and get them lunch. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and we need to look at the patient's oxygenation. So his oxygen level is really low. Um, you already have him on high flow oxygen, so we're going to have to go ahead and breathe for him. Let's go ahead and grab our bag valve mask and hook that up to high flow oxygen. And then we're going to just put that on there and we're going to give some breath straight to the patient. Hey, Becky. Yeah. Our my nurse manager is down the hall. Could you by chance call her in? I'm the only one here right now. Absolutely. Yep, yep, Thank I got you. the numbers. Looks like, yep. looks like she's getting good chest rise with that ventilation. Okay, how is, <clears throat> how's the bagging going? <clears throat> Does it feel like um, it's easy to get the air in? It's a little tight, actually. Okay, one thing you can do, um, is there any sign of trauma at all, Brian? You know, my first assessment, I saw nothing like that that was indicating trauma at all. Okay, let's go ahead and just kind of open up that mouth and get a little bit of tilt and see if we can get a little bit more air flow through there. Okay. How's that there? All right. You got a good seal now, so we're able to get that 100% oxygen into the patient. Looks like she's able to squeeze okay. a lot easier. Okay, ventilating easier, you said? Okay. Do we have any IV access? Uh, actually, the ambulance had several attempts and could not get one, so we don't quite have one yet. Okay. The patient's blood pressure is really low at 80 over 50, so this patient's actually in shock. So we need to get some kind of access pretty rapidly. We're going to have you guys put in an interosseous line, so that is actually a needle that's going to go straight into the patient's leg bone, and we can give any medication or fluids right through that IV, just like we would um, give through any IV. So any, any medications, we could give blood through there, anything we need. So it looks like you guys have an easy IO gun. Yep, yep. and it, it tells me here, actually, it's on the top of your crash cart if you want to grab it. Okay, thank you. I'm new here. Sorry, sorry. No, here. No, that's why I'm here. Actually, we're about 92%, so the vegan has... Improved, so the ventilation effort is, is going better. Perfect. Okay. I'll document that. Okay, so we're going to get that easy IO. So this is um, a drill gun, and we're going to go right below the knee cap. You're going to feel a little bump. That's called your tibial tuberosity. You're going to go two fingers below that and two fingers towards the midline. You'll feel a nice flat area. Clean that area up. That's okay. right on your tibia bone, and you're going to do gentle, firm pressure and drill 90 degrees right into the bone until you hub it. Okay. Excellent. Okay. 
excellent, perfect. Yep, unscrew the top, and then we're going to be able to just hook that straight up to an IV, and we'll flush it. And I'd like you guys just to use normal saline, and you can do a full liter straight in, because we want to try to get his blood pressure back up. Okay. Should this flow pretty good in this interosseous needle, compared to a regular IV? Sometimes it'll be... Yep, sometimes it'll be kind of a little bit sluggish, so you may have to put it on a pressure bag where we're actually putting pressure on the actual IV tubing um, to get it to flow. Okay, looks like the rate okay. is good. Is there any looks infiltration? Good. Looks good at the site. Okay, if you want to document that, we'll do it 1,000 an hour right now. It'd be great. Awesome, 1,000 an hour. Let's go ahead and give him some Narcan. Narcan is a medication that if the patient happened to take an overdose of narcotics, that would reverse that. And we want to go ahead and give that medication at 0 0.4 milligrams IV, and you can push that medication. Okay, 0.4? Yep, 0 0.4. Yep. Okay. Still banging okay? Brian. Yes. Brian, how's our blood pressure? I was going to say, yep, just, uh, just give me another set of vitals to document. You bet. Current blood pressure is 103 over 67. We have a heart rate of 111, and our oxygen saturation is 92%. Oh, great. So we're improving. That's perfect. Now, while we wait, Narcan is going to work. Okay. Okay, we're going to go ahead and set up for an airway because we're putting we're putting air right into the patient's lung, but some of that's actually going into the stomach as well. So we want to be able to make sure that those stomach contents can't come back and go back into the lungs. So we're going to do what's called an endotracheal intubation. Brian, have you done that before? Um, you know, I agree with you. Um, the, the Narcan is not helping at all. Um, I've only done one on a mannequin, so I might need a little help for this, okay? No problem. I'll walk you through it, okay? All right. Maybe just start setting up for that. Let us know kind of what equipment you have available, um, some suction ready. At least I do want to get the suction ready and then grab the video scope for him. Yep, I grabbed the intubation roll. What do, what do you want for meds? So it uh, looks like from your formulary, you guys use Atomidate and succinylcholine for your intubation medications. How much do you think he weighs? You know, when I look at him, I probably say he's about 210, 220. Okay, perfect. So he's about 100 kilos. Because he's had some low blood pressure issues, we're going to start with a little bit of a low dose so that we don't make that situation worse. So we're going to start with 25 milligrams of Atomidate and 160 milligrams of succinylcholine. And we'll give the atomic okay. first and then the succinylcholine. So let me know when you have that ready. Okay, I'm just drawing it up here. Okay. Brian, let's go over your equipment. Okay. So I have uh, two tubes available. So I got a 7.5 and an 8 -0. Right now I'm gonna start with the eight millimeter tube. Um, I also have my video laryngoscope, which uh, your team has showed me how to use that already, so that's what I practice on, so that's what I'm more comfortable with right now at this time. Um, I have suction ready. Uh, we're begging right now. Our, our oxygen level is still about 92%. We have the IV fluids going. Um, so we got a color change detector okay, for us. Color change. Perfect. How Anything about else you suggest? Airway? A backup oh, airway? Yes. Do you, I'm not familiar. Do you know what we have in our book? Yep. So you have a key backup? tube, and it's in your bottom, the bottom drawer of your um, crash cart. Yep. Okay, thanks. I'm not familiar and, with those. Yep. Should I put some extra O2 on, Dr. Brown? Yep, let's put a nasal cannula on. So we're going to do that at high flow, um, and that will keep his oxygen level from going down and decreasing while we're doing this intubation. So we're going to recap our oxygen levels better, our blood pressure's improved, and we're getting ready for intubation. So Brian, you just let me know when you are ready. And we can watch your guys' monitor um, during the procedure as well and let you know heart rate and SATs. Okay. okay. I think I got all the equipment ready. 
I got my device. I think I'm ready for the medications. Okay. Let's go ahead then and switch to the video laryngoscope view. And then, Lisa, just let me know when you're pushing medications, and I'll jot the time down. Okay. Autonomy. It's going in. Okay. And then sucks right after. The sucks no calling right after. Okay. All right, so now we're seeing the view that he can see from his scope, and we're going to be, everything will be upside down as we go into the patient's mouth. So, Brian, when you feel like he's kind of um, loosened up, then go ahead and kind of go into the airway. So we can see at the top of the structure, that's the tongue, and then at the bottom, you see that, um, what looks like a little mountain there, that's your uvula, that's the little piece of flesh that hangs down in the back of your throat. So, Brian, I'm going to have you just inch forward into the airway. And we should be shortly seeing a little flap. There it is, right at the top of the screen. That's your epiglottis. So that's the flap that will cover your windpipe when you swallow so that the things you eat and drink don't go down into your windpipe or the trachea. So you're going to go ahead and put that laryngoscope blade right on top right in that between the tongue and the epiglottis and start lifting. Now we see kind of bumps there. You see all those bumps? Those are your yeah, arytenoid cartilage. Yep, that's your arytenoid cartilage. So you're almost there. You're right at the opening of the airway. And so if you give a nice little lift up, we should be starting to see right into our trachea and seeing our airway. Excellent. So now we can see partial view there, those white stripes there. Those are your vocal cords. So that's where we want our tube to go. So I think if you give, if you just give a little bit more of a lift, you should get a full view. Perfect. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and try and put that that tube right through the hole. Sasser 93, Becky. Heart rate 115. Okay. All right. You're got it. Right into view. Perfect. You can see that balloon going in. Sometimes you may have to pull out that stylet a little bit. Okay, I think I, I want to go to the vocal cords. on your monitor in your room. Perfect. Great. So what we'll do now is we'll, we're going to check and make sure that we're still in. Lisa, can you listen to breath sounds? Yep. So now we put that same bag valve mask right up to that tube. And then we have, um, we have an, what's called an end tidal CO2 detector that we can put on there that will actually change color if we're in the right place. Brian. So I got yellow, Dr. Rowe. Yeah, I got a yellow. Yellow's perfect. Excellent. Good breath sounds bilaterally. Okay. And did you got put it. your balloon up? Yep. Okay, so that's that a nice Excellent. Great. How's our oh, blood pressure? Thanks doing? a lot, Dr. Rowe. That was uh, a little tense for me, so I appreciate that. No problem, Brian. Everything you guys did, starting oxygen, getting that inner osseous line going, getting the oxygen level up, improving his blood pressure, and now securing his airway, those are all things that really help to save this patient's life. So if you guys would not have intervened, I don't think his outcome would have been the same. So excellent work on your end. Awesome. I actually can hear the helicopter landing right now, so... I, I think That's we're probably about that point. It's probably close. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. It. I don't know what we'd do without you. Great job, you guys. All right. Very good. And I think we'll send it back to Deanna. Well, I hope that was as exciting for you. I still I see that um, a lot, and I still get excited when I see it. I have walked back into our clinical area and. This happens really nearly every day where they are helping people in our rural communities save lives. Um, I want to make sure that you understand we really are rural. Nine of our 13 states um, that we work in have the largest number of frontier access counties and 155 of the hospitals where we serve out of those 140 are critical access facilities. One of the smallest uh, tertiary, or I'm sorry, critical access facilities is actually Frontier, Jordan, Montana. Those folks in the, in, the, in the best days have to travel 90 minutes to get to a tertiary facility. 
So you can imagine if you're that patient who really needs that airway uh, placed for you, it's important that it happens immediately, and um, this is really what telemedicine has been able to do. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that, you know, we really, you can imagine if you are those providers, you saw their, how uh, gracious they were to Dr. Rowan and to Becky, and honestly, um, they really work as a collegial team, and they feel very good about being those those who are able to work together to save those people in their community, and it really does make a difference for us to be able to retain and sustain uh, people working in those communities, retain some of those patients staying local, and as important, getting them transferred into a tertiary facility packaged and ready to go as quick as possible. We focused quite a bit today on what it's really like for our providers and what it's really like for the nursing staff. You can see how they work very much in colleague collegially. You can see how it really makes access in those critical access facilities very similar to what that would be if you were working um, in a, or if you arrived in an urban center. I want to talk for just a minute about the patients. Um, you may wonder, this patient, of course, wasn't awake and alert and uh, couldn't say much, but you would know that his family would be very happy that he was able to receive the care that he had. Um, and we also want to make sure that we do focus a bit on the patients. And the next thing that you're going to see is actually a video of a woman who was the recipient of telemedicine and who was able to talk to us about her after that experience. Before we go, we want to thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you what it's like to be part of telemedicine what it's like to serve to those working in rural communities, how much of an important part of healthcare they are across the U.S. And we also want to, again, thank our partners at uh, USDA, at, uh, at HRSA, the Oath, the Oath Grant folks, as well as our partners, the Helmsley Trust, who have really made sure that we are able to provide these telehealth services across rural geographies. Um, so the next thing you'll see is um, our, a, a patient of ours who is talking about her telemedicine experience. Hi, my name is Michelle Patterson. I was bitten by a rattlesnake in June of 2010, and this is my survival story. It was a hot summer day, June 2010, in Marty, South Dakota, I was with my friends and we stopped by this trailer house to get some water and there was a rattlesnake outside. He was coiled up. I didn't know he bit me so I jumped in my car. I just remember like razor blades going up my legs like it felt like I was being paralyzed and then I couldn't breathe and then I went out for a little bit. Then I remember going to the Wagner Community Hospital in Wagner. I begged them for my life. Don't let me die, don't let me die. She had a severe bite. Uh, she received a real good dose of venom, and uh, almost right away she went into shock. Um, from what uh, she describes, she could feel the numbness coming up her leg. She dropped her blood pressure, her pulse rate went up. So when we were able to get on camera with her, she was quite unstable. In this case, we were lucky enough to have our flight team dispatched early, so by the time she got there, the helicopter was landing. So we had at the bedside two family practice physicians and two of our flight team members. So at that point, we were able to uh, instruct all the doctors, all of our flight crew, and essentially walk them through this procedure. At the point where we couldn't intubate Michelle, uh, we decided emergently we needed to do something else. We had to go ahead and establish their airway in her neck. We truly only had seconds. At that point, her airway was failed, her oxygen level was dropping, in addition to her pulse. So in this case, seconds really mattered, and we were able to slip it in just in the nick of time. What makes this case uh, truly remarkable is uh, how we could use our technology here at eCare to help save lives, uh, essentially uh, using the cameras to peer inside an airway, using a handheld camera uh, to appear just above uh, the neck to go ahead and perform these life-saving procedures. And I remember waking up looking this way and I see my daughter sitting there. And I couldn't talk to her. <laughs> I thought I was dead. And I just thank God that I'm here where I'm at right now, even through all the hard things I go through. But 
without that technology, I don't think I would be here on this earth today. And here I am living in Marty, South Dakota, thanks to the help of Avera McKinnon. I thank you guys very much for saving my life. You know, it makes me feel really good, but the true heroes will always be these rural providers that are at the bedside with the patient. We're here in a support role, uh, but seeing them do so well really makes us proud at eCare. I want to thank uh, Vera and Deanna and, and, and the folks at the CH in uh, Montana for taking part in that. Um, it was just a really good example of, 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 of how this can be used. Uh, we're going to um, shift now and hear from our colleague, Dr. Chris Four, uh, with Indian Health Service. He's based in Albuquerque and going to talk a little bit about how the Indian Health Service deploys this technology and uh, also about uh, their upcoming partnership with Avera uh, to better serve the Great Plains area. So uh, my no name problem. is Dr. Chris Four. Okay. Uh, and I'm the director for the IHS Telebeaver Health Center of Excellence. I'm based here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We're the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Uh, I'm coming to you from one of our telehealth offices. So uh, you can see it's pretty plain to do our telebeaver health. Uh, we don't want a lot of distractions behind us or on the walls for our patients. So that's why it's a little spartan here. Uh, but I do want to spend some time talking about IHS and what we are doing with telehealth and sort of where we came from. For those of you who may not know IHS, we're tasked with providing health care for the 587 tribes in this country. Many of those tribes are located in rural, frontier, remote areas, so getting health care to them is a challenge, to say the least. Uh, it's difficult to retain providers, to recruit providers out there. When we look at rural America overall, uh, especially on today, you know, with the HRSA Rural Health Day, we really do see a shortage of providers out there. And so one of the ways that we help address that shortage of providers is through telehealth. We can connect providers in other areas to areas where providers aren't located and our patients are, so we can get that care. And especially when we start talking about specialized care, um, the types of care that normally we wouldn't have access to for various reasons. Maybe we can't get that provider there. One of the things that we come up against is that maybe our provide, maybe our hospital or our clinic just doesn't have the volume. You know, for an to come to one of our small clinics, they, they don't have enough patients to employ that person full time, but maybe through telehealth, they can have that provider, that specialty care once a week or once a month, and that, that's a way of making great use of the resources. So I, I want to talk a little bit, because that's sort of why we would look at telehealth but I want to talk a little bit about the history of telehealth within IHS. So IHS was actually at the forefront of this movement uh, back in the 80s. Uh, there's some great pictures of Dr. Mark Horton and Mark Carroll uh, out on the middle of the Navajo Reservation with this huge truck. It basically was uh, like a motor home with a huge dish on it. Uh, those of you who are old enough, you know, now we have the small dish TV satellites. These are huge, they're about five feet across, and they would actually do telehealth that way. It was a very elaborate, cumbersome system, but it was, again, a way to get care where people would normally go without or not have that access. So uh, we've been doing this for a long time. Now, currently, I think we're sort of in a revolution for telehealth within the agency. You know, IHS is dedicated to getting the best care, the best quality of care to American Indians and Alaska Natives. And to help us achieve that goal and to maintain that goal, we're committed to using technology to get services when they're needed and where they're needed. And, and that's really what telehealth is all about. Uh, I would like to thank Avera. They're our new contract partner in the Great Plains area. You saw the tele-emergency room demonstration. That is one of the services that we'll be rolling out to our federal sites within the Great Plains area, some of the federal sites in the Great Plains area. And it's exciting. You can see the value it brings. Another piece of our uh, contract with Avera is going to be specialty consultations. Uh, these will be you know, not urgent or emergent, but these are things that you can schedule out and you need a dermatologist or an endocrinologist. And instead of our patients having to travel, Avera will help us bring that into our facilities. So we're really looking forward to working with Avera as we move forward and uh, seeing all the great things they've done in the past. And we're, again, looking forward to this partnership with our contractor. 
I also want to mention that currently we have two nationwide telehealth programs that exist within the Indian Health Service. One is the tele-ophthalmology program run by Dr. Mark Horton. Mark Horton has been with us for many years. And this is a great program that's in over 100 sites in IHS, tribal, and urban facilities all across the country. This program uses a specialized camera to take a picture of the inside of your eye to see if you're at risk of going blind due to diabetes. We know diabetes is a big issue within our population, and so this screening helps many, many people get screened. Last year, as a matter of fact, in FY15, Dr. Horton's program screened over 19,000 Native Americans. That's huge, and it's really prevented hundreds of people from going blind. His program continues to grow. It's longstanding. It started in 2000, so this is an early telehealth program that's been very successful within the Indian Health Service. The other program I want to tell you about is the program that I manage, the IHS Telebaby Health Center of Excellence. We provide Telebaby Health Services all around the country, primarily from here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We have sites from coast to coast and from border to border. We are currently in 26 sites around the country, with many more um, in the wings waiting to come on board. We provide uh, telepsychiatry, telecounseling, addiction psychiatry, child psychiatry, a lot of behavioral health services, because when we talk to our tribes in our ITS facilities, they often tell us that uh, behavioral health is one of their top priorities, and also one of the issues or one of the that they have trouble recruiting and retaining in their facilities. So we've been able to provide them that service via televideo. As of uh, last year, FY15, we saw over uh, 5,600 patients uh, through my center, and this year it looks like uh, there will be even more uh, patients seen um, via our center. So again, it's a great way to get that service out there where it normally would be difficult to have that level of care, especially when we look at the specialty care, child services, and addiction, psychiatry. Those are services that just within favor health are very um, difficult to come by, so we're very pleased to be able to get them out into the field. I want to also talk about some other telehealth programs within the agency that maybe are a little bit less visible. One of the biggest probably programs, and I say probably because I don't have all the numbers, but is really invisible is our radiology program. We have most of the radiology services provided within the Indian Health Service are tele-radiology services. The image is taken at your site and then it's read by someone in, potentially in another state. Uh, not on site, though. Uh, we find that this has been very cost effective, but also very, very efficient in giving us great reads. And so teleradiology is something that almost every facility in, in the health service is using, and it's invisible to our patients. They just get the care that they need. And that's really where I see telehealth going, where it just becomes care as usual. It's not a differentiation between, yeah, I'm doing tele, or that I'm seeing the, the provider in the office. It's just care, and that, that's really where where I think we're moving towards within Indian Health Service. A couple of other regional programs I'd like to mention that are out there. Um, Tele-wound care offers some great opportunities, especially, again, talking about our patients with diabetes and chronic illness, where being able to get them that wound care without them having to travel is great. Um, Tele-nutrition and tele-dietary. Uh, again, services that are very easy to provide via a televideo mechanism and saving our patients lots of travel time. And, and lastly, teledermatology. Again, it's something that is very similar to teleradiology. You can take a picture of what's going on, the issue on your skin. It gets sent to a facility to be read, and then the report comes back. So your primary care provider who you're engaging with will have the information he or she needs to give you the appropriate diagnosis and treatment based on this expert consultation that comes from else outside of the facility. So that's sort of where we are within Indian Health Service. Uh, I want to briefly talk about, as a patient, as a family member, as a community member, what can you expect from telehealth? What can telehealth do for you? Uh, because that's really uh, the important thing here. So the first thing, and the most obvious thing, is it really impacts the amount of time and money you have to spend on your health care. Here, an example, uh, there's a family that I know here in New Mexico, before we started Telebeaver Health, they would drive seven hours for a 30 minute child psychiatry appointment. That's pretty ridiculous, but they were committed. Their, their child needed the care, they were committed. That's expensive, um, time off work, time out of school. It was very, very challenging. Now that we have telehealth, telebeaver health in that community, they don't have to do that anymore. They come to our clinic 
we see the child there. The psychiatrist is still here in Albuquerque. Um, and so there's, that distance still exists, but the fact that they don't have to travel that really makes their lives much easier. And if you look at overall between the program I run, the program Dr. Horton runs, we've saved hundreds of hours in drive time for our patients and thousands of miles. Um, there's just such a benefit to our patients in, in delivering services via, via this modality. Another sort of side benefit is we can really keep patients closer to their home and to their family. You know, if you have someone in a facility and they need to go outside the facility to get an assessment done or some specialty care, we're taking them away from their support system oftentimes. And so we can actually keep them in that community. They can still get the service, but still have their supports around them. We all know how important that is in our native communities. So I think that's another huge thing for us. I mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again, that for many of our patients, they're not working. They may not be getting paid. They may not have the luxury of sick leave. And so if they have to drive four, six, eight hours for a medical appointment or choose between that and going to work and missing work, you know, that, that can be a tough decision for some of our families. So the fact that they can do this and not have to miss as much work is very important. Same for our children who are in school, the, those youth that we provide telehealth services for. You know, they can stay in school, be learning, and just miss maybe half an hour. Or maybe they can even sque squeeze it in after school rather than having to drive for so many miles. So um, those are some of the great benefits. The other thing I will say uh, on the telebaker health side is we found that people really like it. Our patients really engage with the process and are able to, um, they tell us all the time how much they like the service, that they feel it's a very private, confidential visit, that they feel like they're getting a good quality care. And so uh, time and time again, we, we're told how much our patients like it. So that's another plus. Sort of in summary, as I wrap up here, I'm going to talk about sort of the IHS and the future and where we're going with this. As I said earlier, I'm really looking to forward to the day where telehealth just becomes healthcare and we don't really differentiate. It's just how are we going to get our patients the best care that we can and the best access to care. And that's really what this is about, is access to care, filling in the gaps in our system. You know, telehealth within our system is not looking to replace any of your existing providers or displace any services there. We're there to, act, uh, to accentuate your care, to fill in the gaps, um, to give you services on site that you would not have available otherwise. And really what we're doing is we're using telehealth and technology to meet the mission of IHS and providing the highest quality health care that we can to American Indians and Alaska Natives. And with that, um, I think I'm done. I appreciate your attention today, and thank you to HRSA for your, ability, uh, for your ability to connect me remotely and for this opportunity to speak about telehealth and IHS. Uh, so, Tom, I will throw it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Four. appreciate your time. And I think, I think Dr. Four makes some really important points um, about it not being a separate way of delivering health care, but a tool for providers. And I, I think that's really essential and, and really where this technology is going. And um, so I can't say it any better than that. Um, I would also note that, that we've made a change in our programs at the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth. Um, and, and Bill England has led that. He's the director of the office. Uh, Carlos Mena is one of our project officers. Natasha Manzanero is here. Anthony Oliver is in the back. All of them and, and Monica Callan have all led an effort. Uh, to really switch our program from, we still want to focus on access, that's important, the technology is important for that, but we also want to know what the impact of that access is. Is it driving better healthcare outcomes? And so we also have a telemedicine research center, we have a national network of telehealth resource centers, many of which are on this call today, um, because I think we want to do all we can to help people leverage this tool uh, to improve healthcare outcomes. And so I think today you've gotten a, a little bit of a flavor about um, uh, what telehealth is and how it can be used. I really want to thank again uh, uh, Vera and all those folks who uh, did a very realistic demo, almost too realistic for my taste. Um, but I think we understand again what an important tool it is for those um, small and isolated communities. Um, also, I just want to thank uh, Michelle Daniels and Sahira Fula and Kim Dickerson because they're the ones that made all this happen along with the the facility staff because hooking up this many different places is not easy. I think we've also seen that broadband access can be a challenge in some areas. We need to increase the, uh, our broadband capacity in order to better leverage this technology. But um, again, I hope that, that if folks have more of an interest, please feel free to follow up with us. Um, uh, you know, I think we have a unique opportunity
to collaborate. We've done some work with the Indian Health Service uh, through a grant we have in Pine Ridge um, looking at the very issue that Chris raised, which is how can we help children that need access to behavioral health care services get access to it so they can get that care close to home in a school-based setting. And um, really, the, the, there's just so much potential with this technology um, that, that we're really looking forward to the next couple of years because, as Dr. Wayfield said, I do feel we're at this unique time in which this technology is becoming affordable, accessible, and clinicians are getting more used to using it. And, in fact, I think folks coming out of health profession training programs may have an expectation for it moving forward. And so I think we're, we're really just at the beginning. But thank you so much for taking time to join us here in the room, but also all the folks who were part of the call. And thank you all the technical folks for actually making it work. That may have been the, the biggest challenge. Thank you, folks.